Our scripture reading this evening is from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 13. Let us hear the word of God as it comes to us this evening. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth a mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Thus far, the reading of sacred scripture. Dear congregation, the question has often been asked and wrestled with in church history, what is the gospel? Many answers have been given, often focusing exclusively on Jesus Christ and the good news of his salvation. But others have asked, how does the gospel relate to the whole counsel of God? Is the whole counsel of God somehow the gospel? And more particularly, what about the warnings in the Bible? Do these somehow relate to the gospel? Are they integral to the gospel itself? Well, this evening, we want to address that question from Revelation 14 and other questions as well. Verses 6 through 13. I'll read again only the beginning of verses 6, 8, and 9. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, and there followed another angel... And the third angel followed them. In other words, there's three angels here. And so with God's help, we want to look at three angels' warning pronouncements. Three angels' warning pronouncements. The first angel's gospel pronouncement about the fear of God. The second angel's dramatic pronouncement about the fall of Babylon. The third angel's dreadful pronouncement about the fate of the lost. And then the conclusion of our text really is the Holy Spirit's hopeful announcement, pronouncement about the future of the saints. So warning pronouncements. We'll see the fear of God, the fall of Babylon, the fate of the lost, and then the comforting conclusion, the future of the saints. There are three visions in Revelation 14. First, the vision of the Lamb on Mount Zion, which we saw last week from verses 1 through 5. 
Second, the vision of the three angels, which we're looking at tonight, verses 6 through 13. And then next week, God willing, the vision of the harvest of the earth, which is the rest of this chapter. And that will open the door for us for the Lord's Supper two weeks from now, God willing, to look at those amazingly comforting verses that introduce chapter 15. But these three visions in Revelation 14 together present a very sobering message to us, a discriminatory message. They teach us that in every group of people, even in the church, there is a a dividing line, an invisible dividing line. The message of this whole chapter really is this, that some are followers of the Lamb and some are followers of the beast. And the contrast throughout this chapter is very strong. These two groups are set apart, as we read in the opening verses of our text this evening, by the everlasting gospel. And so Revelation 14, through this series of three different visions, teaches us that this line of division that runs through the church and through the world will culminate in the final harvest of the earth, when the angels will put in their sickles and there will be a final judgment. And that's why the question is so vital for every one of us, for every churchgoer. On what side do I stand? Am I a follower of the lamb or am I a follower of the beast and of the dragon, Satan? And if I'm a follower of the beast, how do I come out of that following? And how do I become a follower of the Lamb? How do I come out from the kingdom of Antichrist into the kingdom of the Lamb? And so what we have in this vision before us tonight is a vision of three angels with one message and one purpose, to warn mankind of the coming judgment. The message of these angels is to say to us tonight, men and women, boys and girls, teenagers and seniors, if you're in the grip of Antichrist, you must flee from the wrath that is to come. The angels are preaching to us tonight the everlasting gospel through the warning pronouncements that that gospel embodies. Now, there are many people that are confused by that when they read verse 6, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And then a message of warning comes they don't understand what is going on. It seems strange. And some people try to explain it away. They say the word gospel means good news. And therefore this angel, this first angel in verses 6 and 7, seems to have no good news. Listen to it. The angel flies in the midst of heaven, that is, between the sky, the sky, in the sky between heaven and earth, So he's clearly visible to all, and of course this is figurative. He comes to proclaim the everlasting gospel, and this is what he proclaims. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. So some say, Well, there really isn't much gospel here. Some premillennial commentators actually say, this is another gospel for another time period. Not the gospel of grace and salvation, but the gospel of the kingdom, they say. It's a gospel that's to be preached during the so-called tribulation period, when the, the church has been raptured away. It's a different message. It's another kind of gospel. 
Well, that can hardly be true, can it? Because the Bible only speaks about one kind of gospel. Paul, Paul tells the Galatians that even if an angel comes flying through the air and preaches to us any other gospel than the true gospel he preached, let him be accursed. There is only one everlasting gospel. Now, I suppose that part of the problem with understanding this phrase here, everlasting gospel, comes from the fact that our vision of what the gospel is, is really too narrow. We, we know, of course, that the simple gospel approach that many people embrace, in which they narrow the gospel down to four quick spiritual laws, and you go through it in five to ten minutes, and, and, and you're converted within ten minutes, uh, is a very shallow form of Christianity. We would, we would all reject that. But too often, we forget the gospel is also being preached when the minister proclaims the dire consequences of rejecting that gospel. And that is the case before us tonight. The gospel, although it focuses repeatedly on Calvary, is really as big as the Bible itself. The gospel is everything that God has revealed to us. The whole Bible is gospel because the whole Bible is designed to call sinners from darkness to light. It may not be the gospel in in the very narrow sense in which we're prone to define it. And at first glance, we do we, we see little mention of sin here, little mention of atonement in this first angel's message. But there's more than one way to bring the gospel. And this first angel is bringing the gospel through these concepts. Look again at verse 7. The fear of God, the judgment of God, the glory of God, and the worship of God. And this, too, is a legitimate way to bring the gospel. But you may say, but but there's no mention of sin here. How can you bring the gospel when you don't mention sin? Well, is that really true? What is sin? Sin is to despise the word of God, right? Sin is a transgression of the law, a despising of God's word, his commandments, which is, of course, The problem with the world today, the problem that's in the church today as well, there's a kind of lawlessness. that There's no fear of God before their eyes, God says, of the ungodly in the Bible. Men and women, boys and girls, tend to despise God. We, We really rebel against God by nature. We despise Him, and what we need most of all is to be saved and to fear God and worship Him. And that's possible through Jesus Christ. So this is really part and parcel of the gospel. Let me explain just through one example, one biblical example. You remember David in Psalm 51. He's committed adultery. He's been responsible for the murder of Uriah. He's guilty of hypocrisy. And God comes to him and smites his conscience. He becomes a lost sinner before God again And he cries out against thee, the only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be clear when thou speakest and when thou judgest. And we're prone to look at that and say, David, what do you mean you've only sinned against God? You've sinned against Uriah. You've you've murdered him indirectly. You've sinned against Bathsheba. You've committed adultery with her. You've sinned against the, the society. You've sinned against all the people of Israel over whom you're king. But you see, that's all true, of course. But in order to sin at all, David had to despise God. That is what sin is. God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. David knew that, but in his heart he said, actually at that moment, I care more about what I want than about what God says. I want to commit adultery, so I will do it. And so he despised God. He despised his law. There was no fear of God in David's life at that very juncture. 
And you see, that is the awfulness of sin, the sinfulness of sin. Sin is anti-God, always. Big sin, little sin. The enormity of our sin lies in this fact that in order to sin at all, we have to despise God and despise his law. That's why I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that the Puritan Stephen Charnock said, every sin is a pretending that God is not. And so you see, when the angel comes and says, fear God, and give glory to God, and worship God, he's preaching the only way to the good news. The good news in Christ is, brings the fear of God and the glory of God and the worship of God. And that really is what life is all about. Ultimately, that is what the gospel is all about. Why did Jesus come to die on the cross? Well, you say to glorify God, right. Why else? To save his people, right. Why else? Just to get them saved? No. Not just to get them across the line of regeneration, but being saved that they may worship God and give glory to God and walk in the childlike fear of God. So make them God-fearing worshipers. And so what this angel is doing in this first pronouncement is actually in a warning way, speaking of the hour of judgment to come, speaking that Christ is on his way to judge the world, he's saying there are three marks of grace here that are critical to know if we're going to know if the gospel is in us, these marks of grace must manifest themselves. Hence, fear God, worship God, glorify God. So, do you really want to know if you're following the Antichrist, the beast, or if you're following the Lamb on Mount Zion? You have to ask yourself three questions. First, am I worshiping God? What am I doing with my religion? What is worship? Well, worship is this. I'll read it slowly. To worship God is to bow down before his majestic glory and in spirit and in truth to bring him in and through Jesus Christ and according to the scriptures, the honor and the praise that belong to him alone. When I did a series of sermons some years ago on worship for for the uh, second commandment. We developed this definition in in a whole sermon, piece by piece. Every ingredient here is important, you see. If you're a worshiper of God, you know what it means, not as much as you want to or to the degree you want to, we always come short, but you do know something of what it means to bow down before the majestic glory of God and in by the Holy Spirit and in truth, to bring God through Jesus Christ in accord with the scriptures, the honor and the praise that belongs to him alone. If that sounds entirely foreign to you, and you don't know what that means to truly worship God, have the outgoings of your heart go to him to praise him for his salvation in Jesus Christ, you're not a child of God. What about the second question? Are you fearing God? The angel flies through the heavens and says, fear God. And you've heard me give the definition of the fear of God that I think is so beautiful from John Brown many times. To fear God is to esteem the smiles and frowns of God to be of greater value than the smiles and frowns of men. I just can't think of a better definition than that. It means to put God in and through Jesus Christ and by his spirit, just like with worship, in our whole entire worldview and our daily practical living. It means that not just one little piece of the pie of my life, not just on Sunday or just in 
my relationship with the church, but it means every piece of the pie of my life, my friendships, my recreation, my leisure time, my, my hobby pursuits, every piece of the pie of my life, I want to live esteeming God higher than men, valuing his smile more than the smile of men, fearing his frown more than the frowns of men. Now again, I'm sure you don't have that fear of God to the degree you wish. But again, I ask you not about degrees here. I ask you, do you know something of it? Is the fear of God a governing principle in your life? Do you yearn to please God? Do you want to live to his glory? This is the angel's cry. This is his warning cry of everlasting gospel. If you're going to be saved by the gospel, these fruits must be manifest. You must be God worshipers. You must be God fearers. And then thirdly, you must be God glorifiers. Which, of course, is then the third question. Are you glorifying God? Again, not to the degree you wish, but is the principle of it there? Well, you say, I don't, I don't know exactly what it means to glorify God. We, we always talk about glory. I don't even know what the word glory means. And that's true of a lot of Christian words that we use so commonly. We, we actually sometimes forget what they mean because they're so common. Well, the word glory in Hebrew is kabat, and it derives from a root meaning weight or weighty. For example the, example, the value of a gold coin was determined by its weight. And so to have weight, therefore, is to have value or worth. And in the Greek, interestingly, the word for glory is doxa, from which we get doxology, to praise God, to glorify Him. But actually has the root meaning of opinion. So, When you combine the two, this word refers to the worth or value which we, in our opinion, assign to someone or something. So the question then is, what value do we assign to God in our lives? That will tell you whether you're glorifying God or not. We're always glorifying something. We're always assigning great value and weightiness and worth to something. We're worshipers, as Calvin said. We're constitutionally religious. We're worshiping something. Be it a friend, be it a hobby, be it an interest, or be it our work, or, or be it God. And so God's goal, you see, in this world is to manifest His glory, and the goal of a true believer is to return that glory, to respond to God's manifestations of His glory in nature and through the Scriptures, to respond by giving glory back to God. And so that becomes the main purpose of a believer. The main purpose of of a believer is not just to get converted. That's foundational. That's critical. But the main purpose of a believer is to glorify God, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, and to enjoy Him forever. Well, that begs the question, then, how do you glorify God? Well, you glorify God by confessing your sins to God and fleeing to Christ for forgiveness. You glorify God by praising and worshiping and delighting in Him. You glorify God by trusting Him and surrendering all things into His hands. You glorify Him by being zealous for His glory. You glorify Him by walking humbly and thankfully and cheerfully before God and becoming increasingly conformed to the image of His Son. You glorify Him by knowing and living and loving His commandments and saying, with David, I will make haste to run in all of them. You glorify God by becoming heavenly minded and cherishing the desire to be with God forever. Now again, I'm not asking you if you have all these things to the degree you want, because every believer always wants more than what he has of all the marks of grace. But are you God glorifiers? Or do all these things that I just mentioned, do they seem like foreign language to you? Is this the goal? Is this the drive? Is this the direction of your life? 
You see, the angel flies through the heavens, and he says, judgment is coming. Fear God. Worship God. Glorify God. He's preaching the gospel, the everlasting gospel, by unveiling the marks that that gospel produces in the lives of God's people. Now comes the second angel, verse 8. He has a dramatic pronouncement about the fall of Babylon. Listen to it. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, when you first read this, uh, as I did, I thought, well, this, what connection is there between verses 6 and 7 and 8 and then the third angel? But actually, there's a big connection. The story of Babylon's fall is actually recorded in great deal, detail for us in Revelation 17, 18, and 19. So we'll be talking more about that a few months from now. But what we need to understand now is that this is a kind of pre-announcement of the fall of Babylon, drawn from Isaiah 21, verse 9, and Daniel 4, verse 30, which mention the fall and the greatness of Babylon. And here, we're told with a double emphasis, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, we have to understand that when something is repeated twice in the Bible like this, this is typical of of Hebrew and Greek literature for for different reasons. For one thing, in, in, in Greek, there's no exclamation points. When we have an exclamation point, we put an emphasis behind it. In Greek, if you want to emphasize something, you repeat it twice. So pay special attention. Babylon is fallen. Exclamation point. But you have to translate it literally, so you say, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And there's a similar thing in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew poetry, particularly, things are repeated twice to, to emphasize one particular truth. Or, or you read in Genesis 41, verse 32, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Pharaoh had the same dream twice. So that he would wake up, And he would know that God was surely going to bring it to pass. It's it's a matter of emphasis, you see. And so here God is saying, through his angel, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This will surely come to pass. But what is Babylon? That's the million-dollar question here. Well, some writers have identified Babylon with the Roman Catholic Church. But it's a bit of a stretch. Actually, it's not right to identify Babylon as belonging exclusively to any one institution or place or time in history. Babylon is a continuing feature in all of history. It's not just one city or institution or person or movement. It's a principle a principle of opposition to God. If I could put it this way symbolically, Babylon is the capital of the kingdom of Antichrist, just as Jerusalem is the capital of God's kingdom. We talk about the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, Babylon is the worldly counterpart to the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the capital of the kingdom of Antichrist. And it gets that reputation symbolically all the way back in Genesis, doesn't it? You remember the Tower of Babel. That is Babylon. The very first announcement and appearance of Babylon in Scripture is there in Genesis 11, when after the flood, the people bound themselves together, built a city and a tower to reach up to heaven in order to ungod God. That tower is the Tower of Babel. And you know how God came down. You know the story, boys and girls. He confused the language of the people and their attempt to build failed. The tower represented, however, the opposition, the rebellion, the defiance of man against God. And God said, 
after the flood, you remember, spread around, around the globe, spread everywhere, and fill the earth. But instead, they huddled together, they took counsel, they rebelled against God, and they said, we're going to build a tower. And in the ancient cultures, of course, the higher you built in the air, the closer you were to heaven, the more godly you're supposed to be like. Or, in this case, you're going to unguard God by having a very high tower. Well, that's what Babylon represents. It's human autonomy. I'll do it my way. It's man setting himself against the decrees and counsels of the Most High God. Babylon is the world. Babylon is the anti-Christian spirit that is opposed to God and his people. It's in Babylon that God's people, because of their sins, were brought in captivity. And therefore, in Psalm 137, we read this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required us a required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how shall we sing this Lord's song in a strange land? You see, that's Babylon, spiritually. I doubt if many of us in this congregation have ever been seduced by the false teachings of Rome, but all of us have been seduced, at least to some measure, by Babylon. If you listen to the various forms of media today, just listen to the ads on the various forms of media today, you've already been tempted, haven't you, many, many times to be seduced by Babylon, by this world, with all its suggestive and seductive powers. This world of self-pleasure, this world of do it my way. That's the world we live in. It's called here the world of fornication. The angel calls it fornication, doing my will rather than God's, committing spiritual adultery against God. And you can do that with religion as well as your secular life. A do-it-yourself religion. I was in the Netherlands a few years ago and went to Krabbendijk, my, my father's birthplace. I wanted to see where my father was baptized. We went into the church and it was quite nostalgic for me. And and then when I got done with the tour, the man told me, but this wasn't the exact church where your father was baptized because this is a new building, and the old church was a couple blocks away. So we went over there to see what it, see what it was like and see what was built on it. And meanwhile, and there was a hardware store. And the hardware store was titled in Dutch, Do It Yourself. So there on that ground, Do It Yourself, my dad was baptized. The exact opposite of all true religion. It was just so strangely symbolic. But you see, that's exactly what human nature is like. We are drunk with the wine of the wrath of our own fornication by nature. The seducing powers of the world lay hold of us. That's why James says in James 4.4, the adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He's comparing worldliness to adultery. Symbolically saying worldliness is committing spiritual adultery against God. And you see, here we all need to examine ourselves, believe and unbeliever alike. I'm afraid that some of us can't really sing the songs of Zion because our ears have been opened too much to the songs of Babylon. We can't sing the songs of Zion with God's people in truth because we don't feel one with them. We've, we've been in the world too much. Our minds and our desires have been seeped and steeped and marinated in this world. And we love the attractions of the world so much that it's even hard to concentrate on a sermon when we walk into the sanctuary of God. We're all guilty to some degree. So the message of this angel is a very solemn message for all who are seduced by the world. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. If you don't turn to God and you don't fear God and worship God and glorify God, you will fall by the Antichrist spirit and you will destroy yourself. The second angel you see is a warning on top of a warning. 
but it's also a gospel proclamation. Flee from the wrath to come. Oh, dear congregation, where is your heart today? Are you really certain? As certain as the Bible is certain that Babylon is going to fall? Why do you get excited about this world? It's going to fall. Samuel Rutherford said, build no nest in any tree in this world because the whole forest is coming down. Don't set your heart on this world. Is your heart in the fashions and the thinking patterns of this world? Or are you being fashioned by the word of God? What excites you the most? Searching the Bible or searching the internet? What conversations do you most enjoy? Those that focus on the trivia of the world or those that focus on Jesus Christ? Who are your best friends? Those that love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity or those that try to flirt with the world and try to bring you along even when they attend church faithfully? I'm afraid there's too far too much Babylonianism, if I can coin a word, in all of our hearts. We, need to, we all need to hear the message of the second angel. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, it's certain. And if we believe that Babylon will fall, and then we still continue to live in worldly ways, are we not then guilty of trying to enjoy ourselves with pleasures that God has already condemned and will certainly destroy? And to live that way is to live dangerously. It's to play with hellfire, eternal hellfire, as the third angel tells us. Then the third angel comes. His warning is even more solemn. He proclaims the fate of the lost, the inevitable destiny of those who have worshipped the beast. Read it with me in verses 9 through 11. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. These are dreadful words, horrendous words. And really there's three, three things here we need to notice. The first is this. A disastrous way, a disastrous way. The worshiping of the false trinity of this world, the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast that we saw in recent weeks, the worshiping of this false trinity, rather than the worshipful trinity of the Scripture, will end in disaster on the judgment day. That's what these verses are saying. Worshiping the beast will keep Satan from persecuting you for a short time, but you're soon going to pay the terrible price of having the wrath of God poured out upon you forever. Sinclair Ferguson summarizes this thought so, so beautifully. Let me just read this to you. He says, So the third angel announces the terrible judgment of God that will come on those who have received the false sacrament of the false trinity. The people of God receive the mark, the sacrament, as it were, the identity marker of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in baptism. But the ungodly are named for the dragon and the sea beast and the land beast. They have received the false sacrament. They don't realize that this is the very thing that will identify them for the judgment of the great day of Babylon. And you see how it is described, drinking the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his indignation. Keep going this way, my dear unconverted friend. It will end in total disaster for you. Secondly, 
Not only does this speak of a disastrous way, it speaks of a dreadful place. A dreadful place. Hell is a dreadful place. And actually, these words say, teach us three things about hell. First, it says basically this, hell is unmitigated wrath. The unmitigated wrath of God. Those who worship the beast, look at the text, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Without mixture, no mixture of common grace like we have in this life. You have clothing, you have a roof over your head, you've got friends, no mixture there. The wine of God's wrath will be undiluted. His fury will never be softened or slowed or diminished. But also the text goes on to say that, secondly, that hell is internal and external torment. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone or, or sulfur. You see, by drinking the cup of God's wrath, Unbelievers burn inwardly as it affects their soul day and night, and outwardly as they experience the burning fire and the, smench, the, the smell of the stench of sulfur forever. The eternal fire of God's wrath is described in extreme physical terms, not to, to shock us or to horrify us, but also to indicate to us that spiritual reality will be far worse than any earthly fire. It will be dreadful to fall into the hands of a living God unprepared. And then thirdly, we're told that this hell, this dreadful place, is everlasting. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, says our text, and they shall have no rest day nor night. There's no intermission. There's no relief. There's no escape. There's no annihilation. They will be ever dying, yet never dead. The smoke will ascend forever because the fire is never extinguished. You know, back in Isaiah, the prophet says that hell is going to be a place that the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And the Jews, the Jews of that day were so appalled by that text in Isaiah that it's Isaiah 66, verse 24. What they did was they read it before they read verse 23 because they didn't want to end with this dreadful verse of 24. Because you see, in ancient times, it was such a great disgrace for a corpse not to be buried. And the two worst things you could do to your enemy were either to burn his body or to leave it to rot. But at least when the fire had used up its fuel, it went out. But this text was so terrible in their mind because it said the worm never dies. In hell there will be something foul, something endlessly gnawing at people, a speaking conscience that will be eating at them, devouring them, giving them no rest, day nor night. The Puritan John Flavel put it this way, conscience, which should have been the sinner's curb, on earth, now becomes the whip that will lash his soul in hell. That which was the seat and center of all guilt now becomes the seat and center of all torment. It's a dreadful thing. It's horrific. In hell, just think of it. Every sermon will come back to you. You'll remember all your sins at one time. Every prayer, every plea, every appeal, every offer of grace, every example You'll hear all 12 years of sermons of Reverend Van Walk. You'll hear them again in hell. And you'll regret every opportunity you pass by. And you'll say, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I repent? I neglected all my opportunities. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Inconsolable misery. Guilt upon guilt, sorrow upon sorrow. All your sin, all your wretched, 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 wicked life will come back. And you won't repent. You'll still be angry at God, and you'll be angry at the devils, and you'll be angry, you'll be angry at everyone. Angry at yourself for choosing such misery. Hell is a dreadful place. 
and you'll be angry. Notice, did you notice what verse 11 says? In the presence of the Lamb. Or verse 10, the end of verse 10. In the presence of the Lamb. You won't be able to get away from God. Satan doesn't rule over hell. The Lamb rules over hell. The Lamb rules. Puritan Jonathan Edwards said, For every one, eternity will be spent in the immediate presence of God. He goes on to say, God will be the hell of one person and the heaven of another because in hell he will be present in his anger, his holy fury. You ever had someone really mad at you? Just breathe a sigh of relief. If you can just get away from the person for a moment, well, you can never get away from the anger of holy almighty God in hell. What folly It is to say that God hates the sin, but God loves the sinner. In hell, God will hate the sinner justly. Justly. And be full of fury and anger and rage. Particularly those who've heard the gospel and rejected His only begotten Son. Rejected His love offers to repent of their sin and fly to the Savior and find life and joy and purpose and meaning in life. Well, these words speak of a disastrous way, a dreadful place, but also of an amazing escape because of the presence of the Lamb. You see, this Lamb, which will be so awful to see in hell, in His anger, still has not put an end of you, my unconverted friend, here today. In fact, this lamb has taken that cup of hell, which if you don't repent, you will experience. And he's drunk that entire cup himself. In Gethsemane, he said, Father, oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But the Father said, no, no. And he drank it. He drank it so that you can still be offered tonight the way of escape in Christ Jesus, and bow before the Lamb who sits on the throne and who will judge you one day. He's willing to drink it for you to its bottom bitter dregs. Oh, that you would turn to him now, that you would repent now. And then... Then we read something amazing. Here, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What does this mean? Well, it's a summary of what has been presented to us in chapter 14 of of the lamb worshipers. He's saying, these things in verses 6 through 11, all the warnings will not accrue to the lamb worshipers. Instead, the lamb worshipers will persevere. Notice what it says. Here's the patience or the perseverance of the saints. They'll persevere through all the troubles and trials of the persecuting world, and they'll escape all these judgments. Here's the patience. Here's the perseverance of the saints. So they drink... A sad cup here, but it's not as bad as the cup that those in hell will have to drink hereafter. They will be persecuted. John's writing, of course, to people in his own day, in particular, in the first place. The Christian church is suffering persecution. They're going to jail. They're losing their jobs. Some of them are dying under Nero, Domitian. John is saying, your suffering is nothing compared to those who will be going to hell. Be patient. Persevere. And isn't that what God has always granted to his people throughout the ages? It's wonderful. I just read last week of a, of a man named Archibald Allison, a Scottish covenanter martyr. He got up on the, on, on the scaffolding, and he's ready to have his head chopped off. And he looks at the audience, and this is what he says. What think ye of heaven and glory that is at the back of this cross for me? The hope of this makes me look upon pale death as a lovely messenger to me. I bless the Lord for my lot this day. Give our Lord credit, friends. He is very good, but oh, he is good also in a day of trials, and he will now bring me into sweet company through the ages of eternity 
and he went to die. Oh, the patience of the saints. As dreadful as it is to face the persecution, John is saying to believers of his day, of the dragons and the beasts of Satan in this life, when Christ comes, the future will be worse, far worse, for those who worship the beast than those who worship the Lamb ever experienced, even in the thick of persecution. And so go on being patient. Go on obeying the commandments of God, verse 12 says, and go on in the faith of Jesus. These are the marks by which Christians were known. They were patients under persecution. They obeyed Jesus no matter what, even when the emperor said, say Caesar is Lord and you'll escape the fire. They said, no, we'll obey the commandments of God. We shall make no other idols before us. And they went to the flames or they went to the beheadings. They continued in the faith of Jesus, believing in him. He is Lord. He alone is Lord. And because they were faithful, By the grace of God, they got graciously rewarded. You notice our concluding verse, verse 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So the angels come with three increasingly horrific messages, warning, 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 but preaching the gospel through them, flee from the wrath to come. And then the Holy Spirit turns it around and says, But for those who do run after the commandments of God and by grace manifest these fruits and follow the faith of Jesus, blessed are they when they die. Their future is secure. Their works do follow them. Well, there's three things here that are being said in this last verse as well. Let me just give them to you before we close tonight. The first is this. Actually, it's a thing that John is not saying. (laughs) He doesn't say their works will precede them. Did you notice that? He says their works will follow them. He doesn't say they'll come before the heavenly king and say, here are my deeds. Here's my fearing God. Here's my obeying the commandments. Here's my faith of Jesus. Here's my worshiping of God. Here's my glorifying of God. No, no. There's no entry for those who come on the basis of their deeds. But he says, come, come, just on the basis of Jesus Christ, his glorious sacrifice, and you will enter in. But as you enter in, you will look back, as it were, over your shoulder, and you will see a trail of of, of deeds, of, of exercises of faith that the Lord enabled you to do, and they will follow you, and they will be graciously rewarded in heavenly places. Thirteen times Jesus speaks of the rewards, the gracious rewards coming to believers in glory, especially those who've been persecuted. Your works, like a troop of children, will come behind you. They will follow you into glory. What a beautiful thing. We are beholden, says the Belgian Confession, to God for the good works that we do, We are beholden to him, not he to us, because he gives us the grace to do them. But he's so gracious, he not only gives us the grace to do them, when we get to glory, he'll reward us for the good works done. That's grace on top of grace on top of grace. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. The Holy Spirit speaks here, saying that those who are lookers for Jesus, as Hebrews 9.28 puts it, who die in the Lord, die in the Lord, looking to Jesus. Their life is out to Jesus. They're in the way of Jesus. They're in the faith of Jesus. Their death will be gained. Blessed are they who die in the Lord. Their death will be gained because of what they leave behind and because of what they receive. They'll leave behind a body of death. They'll leave behind labor and sorrow. They'll leave behind a life of affliction. They'll leave behind a life of temptation, a buffeting Satan, an enticing world, They leave behind problems with the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. They leave it all behind. That's gain. And death itself will bring them into communion with God. Dying brings them into communion with Christ's suffering. Dying gives them 
a unique experience of Christ's all-sufficient grace. Dying will transform them into the image of Christ. Dying will be their last opportunity to witness for Christ's glory. Dying will usher them into the very presence of the Lord of glory, to be married to Him, to be His bride, to be sin-free in Emmanuel's land. It's all going to be gain, you see. Blessed are they which die in the Lord, Cursed are they which die outside of the Lord. But blessed are they who persevere. This is the patience of the saints. Dying will initiate us into perfect glory, into perfect activities, into a perfect knowledge of Christ, into perfect eternal life with the triune God. Dying welcomes us into a perfect home, perfect communion, intimate communion, with God. Samuel Rutherford said that God can make 10,000 heavens full of good and glorious joys, but all of them together could not compare to just being with Jesus forever. Blessed are they who die in the Lord. From henceforth, from now to the end of the world, John says, all those who die in the Lord will be greatly blessed. And finally, John John is saying that the Holy Spirit is saying in these verses that every believer will rest from all the work he engaged in on the Lord's behalf on earth. They will rest from their labors. God won't forget their works. He'll crown their efforts with rewards of grace, but they may rest, rest, rest as a lamb worshiper with the lamb Well, let me close then with two applications. First to you, lamb worshipers, let the rewards of grace and your promised future, in contrast to the future of beast worshipers, let it motivate you to go on believing in Jesus Christ alone, to go on keeping his commandments, to go on living unto him. Brand your brain with images of the redemption of the faithful and images of the punishment of the wicked. Do you need help fighting the temptations of this world? Ask God to bring to mind the fall of Babylon, the wine of God's wrath poured out without mixture. When Babylon tempts you, think about the day of judgment. When the beast calls for your worship, think of the torment his worshipers will experience in the presence of the Lamb. And go on, worshiping the Lamb. And finally, my last application. Did you notice that the gospel that comes through these three angels and through the Holy Spirit is prefaced in verse 6 by being called the everlasting gospel? that comes to all that dwell on earth, verse 6 says, to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. That means that every single impenitent sinner on the face of the earth needs to repent before God, before the final day of judgment comes. That includes all of us, but it includes also people everywhere. It includes every Muslim, every Buddhist, every Hindu in the world. Christianity is an exclusive religion. You either repent before Jesus Christ or you are lost forever. And you still are in the day of grace. It's still the time to repent. And if you know this gospel yourself, you should feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to do whatever you can, be it through prayer, be it through evangelizing others, be it through giving financially to various worthy causes around the globe that spread the gospel. You should do all you can to bring this good news to everyone, this everlasting gospel. And let it be your prayer day and night. Lord, let my prayers, let my life, let my stewardship demonstrate my embrace by faith, gracious faith, through the Holy Spirit of this eternal, this everlasting gospel.
Amen. Lord, let us be gospel livers and gospel lovers and bear the fruits of the gospel. Let us be men and women and boys and girls and teenagers who fear God and who glorify thee and who worship thee and who do thy commandments and who have patience under persecution and who are in the way of Jesus and in the belief of Jesus. Give that all these fruits may be manifest in our lives and that we may seek to proclaim this everlasting gospel, even through warning to those around us. Help us to allure and to warn, to win and to woo, as well as to admonish and exhort, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Oh, bless thy word tonight, and work in us this wonderful work of everlasting gospel. May it captivate our hearts. May it consume our lives. May it direct our energies, our giving in prayer, our giving in going places, our giving in finances, our giving in support of those who who do this work in a direct way. Fill the earth with the knowledge of the Lord even from sea to sea, we pray. And let the warnings of the gospel be invitations to us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.